Well, folks, good evening. Welcome to our service of worship this evening. Before we begin to worship God, uh, let me give you the announcements for the week ahead. Uh, God willing, on Thursday evening, uh, there will be a joint Bible study and prayer time, and that will be via Zoom. And uh, if any of you don't get the link and would like the link, please uh, let me know, and I can forward that to you. Uh, the service is next Lord's Day here in the meeting house, uh, half past 11, the Reverend Tim Donaghy, and 7 p.m., the Reverend Andrew Kerr. It was meant to be Mr. Or the Reverend Philip Dunwoody, but uh, Mr. Dunwoody is moving down to Drumour in the course of the next week or so, and he asked to be moved to later on in the year, uh, so he swapped with the Reverend Tim Donaghy in May. Uh, so Tim very kindly agreed to do May, or to do this Sabbath morning for us, and Andrew Kerr was free to do the evening. When you're leaving the building, please leave row by row, and the minister is not going to be standing in the foyer as you leave, so I'm told, so I'll take, that, I'll take note of that, so I'll. <laughs> um, please do not congregate at the front of the building after the service for the impression it may give to the village during this lockdown period, so if you'd keep that in mind as well. The annual congregational meeting uh, is going to be held, God willing, on the 5th of March, that's a Friday evening, at 7.30. And once the business of the AGM is concluded, there will be a time of further discussion regarding uh, the calling of a minister. Now, that doesn't mean that we're meeting to make out a call that evening, we're not. It's just uh, a time to uh, see where we are, where we're going, and to see if there's any other names that people might have in their thoughts. So that's Friday the 5th of March. Uh, there was an announcement sent out, I think, in relation to the denominations pro-life ministry. Um, there are those who are gathering in Newry and Porta Down outside the centres where, where abortions are carried out. And if you would like to be involved in that pro-life ministry, um, please get in touch with me. You can do it by email or whatever, phone me, and I can uh, pass on your details to my wife, Lynn, and she will organise for you to be put on the rota. There's still plenty of room left on the rota, uh, and as I said to my own people this morning, you can go for half an hour, you can go for an hour, you don't need to say anything, it's a silent witness, you'll be standing holding posters, um, but we do believe that this is something that's vitally important in our society today. I was reading uh, just this morning that there are over 1,100 1, children who have been aborted, I think, in Northern Ireland alone uh, in the past year. So we need to be witnessing about these things. And then finally, and sadly, as a congregation, we express our deep and sincere sympathy to the Finch family upon the death of Stephen, Brian and Alan's mother. And we will be remembering the whole family and also Jim uh, for the funeral tomorrow and trust that God will grant his comfort to the family circle. Well, we're here to worship God. We turn to the book of Psalms for our call to worship. And we read from Psalm number 116. Psalm number 116. The psalmist says, I love the Lord, because he hath heard my voice and my supplication. Because he hath inclined his ear unto me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. The sorrows of death compassed me. The pains of hell got hold upon me. I found trouble and sorrow. Then I called upon the name of the Lord. O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. Gracious is the Lord and righteous. Yea, our God is merciful. It goes on and it says, I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. I believed, therefore I have spoken. I was greatly afflicted. I said in my haste, all men are liars. What shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits towards me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows unto the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Let us 
pray as we come to worship God. Let's stand as we pray. Almighty, eternal God, we bow before you this evening in your presence because you have promised to be in the midst of your people when they gather for worship. And we come, Lord God, to acknowledge afresh that you alone are God. Apart from you, there is no other. You are the one, O oh God, who brought into being all things outside of yourself that exist. You are the one who holds all things together. It is in you that we live and move and have our very existence. And the breath of every living creature is in the palm of your hand. We thank you for the gift of life. How precious and how pleasant life is even in a sinful fallen world. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the good gifts that you so richly bestow upon us and that so often we can take for granted. We thank you for health and strength. We thank you, Lord God, for food, for shelter, for clothing. We thank you for employment. We thank you for family, for friends. We thank you, Lord, for all the things in life that are good because ultimately they come from your hand. And Lord God, we cannot but thank you for the ultimate good that you have given us in the person of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord and Saviour. We thank you this evening for the salvation that is ours, the salvation of which many of us have become partakers, and of the wonderful assurance that we have that you are our God and also our Father in heaven. We thank you for your love. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for the strength that you give us, for your upholding power. We thank you, O God, for being with us in all our different changing circumstances and situations in life. And that as you have promised, so you never leave us and you never forsake us. Lord, as we come to worship you this evening, we pray that anything that might otherwise distract us we'd be able to be set aside from our minds and for the short time that we're here that we might be able to focus our thoughts upon you, our great and glorious God. That we might be able to give you the worship that you are due. That our worship might be in spirit and in truth. That the Spirit himself might teach us as we read and study the scriptures and that our time in studying the scriptures may prove to be profitable. Profitable, O oh God, to salvation, and profitable to the sanctification and strengthening and building up of your own beloved people. Father, hear us as we come to you at the beginning of this service. Help us as those who worship you, as those who listen to your word and as one who preaches, and may all be done to the honour and the glory of Jesus Christ, our Saviour in whose name we pray. Amen. Now let us read together from God's word two passages, both from the New Testament. First of all, from the Gospel of John and chapter 15. John chapter 15, please. And we will begin reading at verse number 18. Uh, thereafter, we will read from the opening section of Acts chapter 1 if you want to have your Bibles open there also. So John chapter 15, part of what I suppose is best known as the upper room discourse, Jesus speaking to his disciples prior to his arrest and subsequent trial, if you'd call it that, and crucifixion. And he says to his disciples in verse 18 of the 15th chapter, if the world hate you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. But because ye are not of the world, 
but I have chosen you out of the world. Therefore, the world hateth you. Remember the word that I said unto you. The servant is not greater than his Lord. If they have persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they have kept my saying, they will keep yours also. But all these things will they do unto you for my name's sake, because they know not him that sent me. If I had not come and spoken unto them, they had not had sin, but now they have no cloak for their sin. He that hateth me hateth my father also. If I had not done among them the works which none other man did, they had not had sin. But now have they both seen and hated both me and my father. But this cometh to pass that the word might be fulfilled that is written in their law, they hated me without a cause. When the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father, even the Spirit of truth which proceeded from the Father, he shall testify of me. And ye also shall bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. And then turning over to Acts chapter 1, and beginning at verse number 1. Luke, who writes the Acts, also, as we know, wrote the Gospel of Luke. And he begins by telling Theophilus that both in what he wrote in his Gospel and what he also wrote here in the book of Acts, uh, that it was all about what Jesus was doing and continued to do. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and to teach until the day in which he was taken up after that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which, saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power. But ye shall receive power after the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as ye have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned, then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is from Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. Now before we come to listen to God's word being proclaimed, let us once again seek God in prayer. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we give thanks that when we call, you hear, and when you hear, you answer our prayers. We give you thanks, Father, that we can come as individuals and bring our own particular circumstances and needs before you, and that we're encouraged many a time to do that in your holy word. But Father, we thank you that we can come and we can pray for others also. You've told us to bear one another's burdens, 
and so fulfill the law of Christ. You've commanded us, pray for one another. And Lord, we do that this evening. Father, we come and we would pray especially for the Finch family circle. We pray, Lord God, that as they go through these days of mourning, and as they prepare to lay to rest the mortal remains of their loved one tomorrow, that in a very real and in a very special way, Lord, they will have a sense of your presence and of your upholding grace. You have described yourself to us, O God, as the one who is the Father of all mercies and the God of all comfort. We thank you that your mercy is an expression of your goodness shown to those who are in circumstances of distress or misery. And Father, we know by our own personal experience that one of the greatest distresses in life is when we lose loved ones who are near and dear to us. We give you thanks, O God, that for those who are believers and for those whose loved ones die in Christ, that whilst we do mourn, we do not mourn as those who are without hope. And we pray, Lord God, that that glorious hope of the wonderful gospel will be something that upholds and bears up your beloved children in the time of their grief. So be with the Finch family tomorrow, with Stephen and Brian and Alan, their wives and their children. And especially, Lord God, we pray you'll be with Jim and grant that in the midst of their sorrow that they might know your peace that passes understanding. We pray also, Father, for the witness that is being born in Nure and Portadown in relation to the pro-life ministry. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for those who have taken up the opportunity of standing and bearing testimony to the sacredness of life, to the awfulness of murder, which in effect is what is happening. And Lord, we pray that even through this very simple way of testifying, that there would be those who, approaching that clinic, would decide not to go in would turn away, and that life might be preserved. Father, be with those who are bearing witness. We know that this is not easy. We know that even they are often filled with fears. But we pray that they might have a sense of your enabling grace. And now, Father, as we turn to your word, we pray that you would help us as we gain further, seek to gain further insight and understanding. And we pray that your word will shape us and mold us into the men and women and young people that you intend us to be. And all for the glory of Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, brethren, as you know, over these past weeks when I've been with you, we've been thinking of some of the ways in which a Christian is described in the Bible. Metaphors, pictures that are used of what is a Christian. And thus far, we have spent a couple of weeks looking at the Christian as a disciple. We have seen the Christian being described in terms of a son of God or a child of God. And the last time I was with you, we considered the Christian as a saint. Some years ago, the park keeper of Frankfurt's Tear Garden came across what he thought to be uh, a down-and-out homeless person. He was dressed very raggedly, and he was slouched across one of the benches in the park. And the keeper of the park came to him and nudged him and says, Who are you? The man raised his head somewhat wearily, looked at the park keeper, and he said, I wish I knew I wish I knew. The man, as it turned out, was not a down and out. He wasn't homeless. He wasn't an uneducated moron. In fact, he was a man by the name of Arthur Schopenhauer. At the time in Germany, 
one of Germany's greatest philosophers. He spent years of his life wrestling with the question, who is man? Why is he here? And his answer to the parkkeeper that day demonstrated that despite all his efforts, despite all his theorizing and philosophizing, Schopenhauer hadn't found the answers to those questions. He was suffering from an identity crisis at the deepest level of his being. Who are you? I wish I knew. Now, as Christians, we have no excuse for and should never suffer from an identity crisis. If the Christian were to be asked the question, who are you? The Christian should be able to respond immediately by giving any one of a number of answers. I'm a believer. I'm a son of God. I'm a steward. I'm a saint. I'm a soldier. I'm a disciple. I'm an ambassador. I'm a brother. I'm an athlete. And many others besides. And then the Christian could go on and explain what he or she meant by describing himself or herself in those terms. We've been looking at some of those over the past few studies. And one of the things that you might have noticed is that all of the words that we use to describe ourselves or that the Bible uses to describe us as Christians in various terms, all of them are nouns. They are descriptive words. But the aim of our study is not just to unpack the meaning of the noun, not just come to a better understanding of the descriptive terms that the Bible uses to describe the people of God, but rather to turn those nouns into verbs. Verbs are action words. Verbs describe what a person does. And our goal in studying these pictures that we have in Scripture is not only to come to a better understanding of who we are, but also that it will help us to become what we are. In other words, that we will not just see ourselves as soldiers, for example, but that we will actually be soldiers. That we will not just understand that we're saints, but they will actually be saints. That we will not just understand what it means to be an ambassador, but that we will be ambassadors. One of the word pictures and metaphors that the Bible uses to describe a Christian that we're going to think about this evening is used in both of the passages that we read tonight. And that is, the Bible describes Christians as a witness. A witness. And that's our study this evening. So as we consider that, let's first of all ask the question, what is a witness? What is a witness? Now this might seem like a rather simplistic question with which to begin our study, but I believe it's an important question. And the reason for that is because as a result of the way that the word witness and its closely associated word testify, they're used synonymously in places in the scripture, the way those are often used in the church, there's the danger that we might have a wrong idea of what it means to be a witness or to give a testimony. The two words, as I say, are very closely related in the Bible. In John 15 and 26, they're used nearly synonymously. Jesus says, when the comforters come, he shall testify of me, and you shall bear witness. The Apostle Paul in Acts 20 and 24 talks about testifying of the grace of God. Testifying of the gospel of the grace of God. Verse 21 of the same chapter Luke speaks about testifying to the Jews and to the Greeks. We read from Acts chapter 1 and in verse 8, where we read, You shall be my witnesses. 
Nowadays, many people in church circles associate these words, witnessing and particularly testifying, either with the practice of giving one's testimony, and that usually involves telling people about how you became a Christian and how one's life has changed and so on, or witnessing the sense of living our lives in such a way to show others by our lives that one is a Christian. And whilst these things may well be part and parcel of witnessing and testifying, the fact is we must be careful not to think that this is what is primarily in mind when the Bible uses these words. It's not. Both these terms are legal metaphors. They're words that have to do with and that take us into the world of the law court. So the judge is sitting on the bench. The prisoner is in the dock. The prosecuting counsel and defense counsel are there. And the witness is placed upon the witness stand to give accurate information regarding the case. He or she is called upon to state things that are facts, that are true. Their testimony is a verbal recounting of events that they saw or of things that they knew to be true relating to the case under consideration. So, for example, if I was here in Loch Brickland, walking down Main Street, and I saw a young fella with his mates in a car wearing a hoodie, baseball cap, stereo right up, deep bass thumping from it, rap music blurring out of the window, and he's raking about, car moving from side to side, doing about 55 or 60 down the main street. And suddenly the car swerves and smashes into another car on the other side of the street, coming in the opposite direction, and in it is a woman who was driving at 25 miles an hour, driving straight, realizing that it wasn't her that caused the accident. And a few weeks later, I get a letter from her solicitor asking me if I would be a witness in the case that is going to come up at court. My responsibility, if I say yes, is to ensure that I give accurate information in the courtroom of what I knew to be true concerning what happened that day. My responsibility is to state facts, to say what I saw, and to do so in such a way as to defend the woman, knowing her to be in the right. I haven't to say how I felt. I haven't to say anything about what I felt towards the guys driving the car. I simply to tell it as it is. Well, Jesus Christ is on trial before the world. He's in the courtroom of world opinion. The world is judging Jesus Christ continuously and passing its verdict upon him. And the devil is like an unprincipled prosecuting lawyer saying all kinds of scurrilous character assassinating things about Jesus. And many false witnesses are speaking up against him. The Holy Spirit, if you like, is the defense lawyer. And he calls us to be witnesses for Jesus Christ. People who will testify for Jesus. People who will defend him through what they know to be true. People who will bring evidence before the court of the world opinion, which ought to vindicate Jesus. So that's what it means to witness. But then another question comes. Who are to be witnesses? Now if you turn to Acts 1 and 8, you'll find a very clear answer to that question. Jesus, prior to his ascension, in heaven says to his disciples, you shall be my witnesses. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. 
Jesus is speaking here to the men who had been with him throughout his earthly ministry. A part, of course, from Judas. Men who had heard his teaching. Men who had seen the mighty works that he had done. Men whose own lives had been wonderfully transformed by his power. Men who knew him to be who he claimed to be and openly confessed him as such. The Son of God. The Savior of sinners. The only Savior of sinners. And to these men, Jesus said, you shall be witnesses to me. Now here's the question. Does that mean that it was only these 11 men? Who were to be witnesses. There are some who would say that it really is only the disciples and church leaders subsequently and that they weren't referring here to anyone else. Well, brethren, I would say that that's not the case. Jesus was speaking to these men not merely as his chosen disciples, unique individuals with whom he had spent three years but he was speaking to them also in their representative capacity as members of his church on earth. He was speaking to them as Christians. And what he says in Acts 1 and 8 is true not only of these men, but of every person like these men who had come to believe Jesus is who he claimed to be, that he is the Son of God, that he is the Redeemer of sinners, Jesus says they were to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. These men would not on their own be able to witness about Jesus to the ends of the earth. Others also became involved. Timothy, Barnabas, Silas, and so on. Matthew 28 and 19, Jesus says to his disciples, and again speaking to them as representatives of his people on earth, go and make disciples of all the nations, teaching them to observe all things I've commanded you. Jesus says to his disciples, you are to be witnesses for me. What were these witnesses, what were these disciples to teach to others who were converted under their ministry? They were to teach them everything that the Lord had commanded them. Had the Lord commanded them to be a witness? He had. So those who were converted were commanded to be witnesses. It was part of the all things of which Jesus speaks here. And so all those who call themselves Christians, followers of Jesus Christ, are to be witnesses. This is not something that is confined to a particular category of Christian. It's not confined to the minister and elders to be witnesses. And other Christians don't have that responsibility. Witnessing for the Lord Jesus Christ is not something that's reserved for a group of spiritual elite. Some specially qualified class of Christians. And you don't have to be a certain age to be a witness for Jesus. The only qualification you need to be a witness is that you truly belong to Jesus Christ. Let me elaborate on that for a moment or two. The person who is to witness must himself or herself have a personal experiential knowledge of Jesus Christ as Savior. You cannot witness for Christ unless you personally know and belong to Christ. Let's go back to the Christ illustration. Say I went home after seeing the Christ in the main street and said to Lynn, never guess what I saw. And gave her absolutely every detail of what happened. The colors and make of the cars, the people who were in the cars, what direction they were traveling, how fast they were traveling, the manner in which they were driving, and give her, as it were, as much information about the incident as I have. But when it comes to being a witness, 
she doesn't qualify. The reason she doesn't qualify is because her knowledge of the accident is not first-hand personal knowledge. It is knowledge that has been passed on. And in a very real sense, it's just hearsay. She's not speaking from personal experience. She could say the exact same things as me. Maybe even say them just as convincingly or even more convincingly than me. But at the end of the day, our testimony is worthless because there's not a testimony arising out of a personal experience of the things that took place. And in spiritual terms, a witness for Christ must be able to speak about his or, own, his or her own personal knowledge and experience of Jesus Christ. One writer says, the biblical idea of Christian witness presupposes a first-hand living experience of the salvation of Jesus Christ. And I think one of the reasons why many people who go to church don't witness and don't testify is because many of them have no personal experience of Jesus Christ. Their only knowledge of Jesus is secondhand, passed on, impersonal knowledge. Their parents told them about Jesus. Their Sabbath school teacher told them about it. The youth leader told them about it. They bought books and read books all about Jesus. And they've got a great head knowledge of all these things. But they don't actually know Jesus himself. They might be able to say all the right things. They might be able to tell you he's the son of God. Second person of the Holy Trinity. He is fully God and fully man. Tell you all sorts of things about Jesus. But they don't actually know him. You will never be a proper witness unless and until your knowledge of Jesus becomes first-hand personal knowledge as opposed to second-hand passed-on knowledge. Until you have personal experiential knowledge of Christ as opposed to theoretic, theoretical knowledge of Christ. And that's maybe one of the problems in the church today. There are so many who sit in pews and they have no real knowledge of Christ, no saving knowledge of Christ. For those of us who have a personal saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, we are called to be and we have a responsibility to be witnesses for him. So who is to be a witness? Well, if you're a Christian this evening, you are to be a witness. That brings me to the third question we want to ask this evening. Of whom are they to witness? What is the subject of the Christian's witness? What is the man or woman or young person to speak about when they testify? Well, once again, let's turn to Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. And there we read, you shall be witnesses unto me. Or my witnesses. The followers of Jesus are to bear testimony to him. They are to speak about Jesus Christ. When they are witnessing, he is the one to whom they are to direct the thoughts of those to whom they are witnessing. I think that's important. We're not really witnessing for Christ when we go out and tell people about Lock Brickland RP Church and what a good church it is and how faithful it is and how lovely the people are and how many wonderful things that we have going for different groups within the church. They may be precursors to witnessing, but they're certainly not witnessing. In John chapter 1, we have the account of the ministry of John the Baptist. And in verse 7, we read these words. This man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that through him all might believe. He was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of that light. 
What was John's remit? What was it to tell people about himself? It was to point people to the light. And that light, as we know, was Jesus. And as followers of Jesus, we are called to speak about him. And this is one of the wonderful things about this pro-life witness that is going on in our denomination through Let Them Live. It is a gospel witness because it is not merely saying it is wrong to kill babies in the womb. It is getting to the heart of it and it says it is murder. And it is bringing it to the law. And then from there they point people to Christ. It isn't enough as far as they're concerned just to to witness against children being slaughtered. You have to go beyond that. You have to speak about Jesus. And this is one of the very few ministries that does that. There are other ministries that are pro-life, but they do not speak about Jesus in the gospel. They do not say it's murder. We are called to be witnesses for Jesus so that wherever we begin, we must always get to him and speak of him. We are to speak of him and tell others of who he is, the eternal son of God. Tell people why he came to this earth. He came in order to live as a man, a life that none of us could ever live. He came in order to secure a perfect righteousness before God that we don't have and could never have. He came in order to satisfy the demands of God expressed through the law against sins, against sin and the punishment that it deserved. He did that by going to the cross. We're to testify of his free and genuine offer to come to him for salvation because he alone can give it and he will give it to those who seek it. We're to bear testimony to the fact and historical reality of his physical bodily resurrection, of his ascension to the right hand of God, to the many promises that he has given us that he's going to come back again one day. That's what it is to witness of Jesus. Jesus is the subject of our witness as it was the subject of the early church's witness. So no matter where you begin, you must get to Jesus. Daily in the temple and house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus. Philip opened his mouth and beginning at the scripture, he preached unto the Ethiopian Jesus. Started in Isaiah 53, ended with Jesus. Acts 11 and 20, some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists preaching the Lord Jesus. The Apostle Paul in Acts 9 and 20, immediately he preached Christ in the synagogue, that he is the Son of God. And you could multiply examples of this truth. The one of whom and to whom and concerning whom we are to witness is Jesus. And sadly, in the church today, there are many Christians who, when it comes to testifying and to witnessing, they suffer from lockjaw. It's amazing how they can speak about all sorts of other things. The weather, politics, the economy, what's going on in the world, football, baking on TV. But when it comes to To Jesus, they suddenly get lockjaw. Let's ask fourthly, 
Where are we to be witnesses? So we go back again to Acts chapter 1. And in verse 8, Ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I haven't time to go into all the references in the book of Acts and indeed in the rest of the New Testament. But if you were to read them, you'd discover that the early Christians witnessed for Jesus everywhere. Everywhere. When they were in the temple, they spoke about Jesus. In the streets, when they went to the marketplace, even when they were thrown into prison, when they came across a group of people at the banks of a river, they witnessed in a hard hall. They witnessed at public gatherings. They witnessed at people's doorsteps and in people's houses. When they mixed with university graduates and the high-flying academics of this world, of the world of that day, they witnessed to them. They witnessed in the red light districts of cities like Corinth. They went to their political and cultural enemies and witnessed to them. Some of them witnessed before kings and even to members of the household of Caesar. They witnessed everywhere. And brethren, we should be witnesses everywhere for Jesus. And the principle set forth here in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. Jesus was, of course, speaking literally and geographically, but there's also a principle here. Begin where you are, move out from there, move out from there, and move out from there. And if you look at it on a map, you'll see that that's how it is. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. And we're to begin in our immediate vicinity. It's very easy, you know, to get on a, a mission team and to go away to Africa and to witness to people. It's much harder to sit down with your family and witness to them. But who's going to witness to your family if you don't? Who's going to do it? We're to witness to our families, people in our streets, people we work with, people we go to school with, People that are in our group in university. People who are, who are in our bowling club or running club or rugby club or football team or whatever your happens to be your social interest. Computers, gardening club, orienteering, stamp collecting, whatever it happens to be. Wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we should be looking for ways and opportunities to openly witness for Jesus. And I believe that some of God's people need to get involved in things in their local community where they'll actually meet non-Christians. Because an awful lot of Christians don't meet non-Christians. They're with Christians all the time nearly. One thing's for sure, it won't be easy. If you're going to witness for Jesus, you're going to meet opposition. You only have to read the book of Acts to see that. But the fact is that the early Christians did witness despite the difficulties, despite the opposition. And guess what? When they did it, the church grew. The church grew. Thousands were added to the church. Thousands were saved. Maybe one of the reasons that we don't see people being saved today is that Christians don't take the responsibility to witness seriously. Two more questions and then we're finished. How are we to witness? Well, we're to do it with our mouth and we're to do it depending on the power of the Holy Spirit. The disciples were told in Acts 1 to wait for the promise of the Father when they would receive power the Holy Spirit would come upon them. Now that doesn't mean that you're to wait until you feel the Holy Spirit's power giving you boldness and strength and making you confident to witness. 
If you wait to do that, you'll never do it. The Holy Spirit had yet to be poured out. And after Jesus spoke these words to his disciples, on the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit was poured out. So every believer since then has the Holy Spirit and has the power to witness. And it is only by the power of the Spirit that we can do it. Zechariah reminds us of that. Different circumstances, different era, but same principle. Not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. And what we need to do when we wake in every day is to pray that God would grant us that power of the Spirit that we need to give us opportunities to witness and to give us the right words to say when those opportunities present themselves or when we make opportunities to witness. And brethren, let's not hide behind what is often used as a cop-out when it comes to witnessing. And Christians say, oh, I witness by my life. Well, yes, our lives have to be a living testimony that we are different from others. But your life will never tell people about Jesus. Your life won't tell them about him. A witness is someone who speaks words about Jesus. A godly life may give you wonderful opportunities to witness, but in order to witness, you must actually open your mouth and speak. When Philip went up to the Ethiopian eunuch, he didn't walk about and show him what it was to live like a Christian. He opened his mouth and beginning at the scriptures, he preached unto him Jesus. Acts 11 and 20, some of them were men of, from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenist preaching the Lord Jesus. Having time to develop this, you can chew the cud on that one. Let's finish by asking the final sixth question. When should we witness? Well, I would suggest we should witness now. Start right away. Remember Jesus' words in John chapter 9. John chapter 9 and verse 4. He's speaking to his disciples. And Jesus says this, I must work the works of him that sent me while it is day. The night cometh when no man can work. The night's coming, brethren. You have your day on earth. And sometime or other, that day is going to be over. And none of us know when our personal day will draw to a close. And you can only witness for Jesus while you are here. And one day, maybe a lot sooner than any of us think, will not be here. And we can't witness. Maybe you'll say, well, I'll start next week, Mr. Rob. I'll start next year when I'm better prepared of more time. There may not be a next week, a next month, or a next year. There's ample opportunities to start now. You young people might say, well, I couldn't witness for Jesus. I'm too young. I'll wait until I'm older. I hope there is an older for you. I really do hope that. But you're not guaranteed that. Let us witness while it is day because the night comes when we will no longer be able to witness. And there's opportunities. There's an opportunity to sign up and be a witness down in Uri every Monday, Wednesday, or sorry, Tuesday and pour it down every week. What is a Christian? Well, among other things, a Christian is a witness Someone who speaks about, points people to, and speaks up for the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, if you're a Christian, that's what you have to do. And that's what I have to do. May God help us to turn the noun into a verb. May God bless his word to our hearts. Amen.
Let's turn to our closing psalm, please. Thanks, Stephen. So the tune for the psalm, it's Psalm 40, by the way, Psalm 40, and the stanzas that we're going to sing are 8 to 11. Psalm 40, stanzas 8 to 11, and the tune is number 208. To do thy will I take delight, O thou my God that art, yea, that most holy law of thine I have within my heart. Look at verse 10. I never did within my heart conceal thy righteousness. I, thy salvation, have declared and shown thy faithfulness. 8 to 11, we remain seated as we sing. And then please, after the singing of this psalm, stand and receive the benediction. Let us worship God together. I will I take delight on oh, I my God that art in that most holy love I have within of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with the people of God, this night and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>